Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, we journey to the hidden world in the final entry of DreamWorks' How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. Set a year after the second film, and Burke is beginning to become overcrowded from all the dragons they've rescued, and the new chieftain, Hicker, voiced by Jay Baruchel, knows it leaves them vulnerable to attack. This is proven when notorious dragon hunter Grimmel the Grizzly, voiced by F. Murray Abraham, tries to capture Hiccup's Night Fury, Toothless. Remembering a hidden dragon world that his father, Stark, voiced by Gerard Butler, told him about as a child, Hiccup leads the people of Burke to set out to find it and have a safe new home. Along the way, Toothless falls in love with a female Light Fury, but Grimmel is pursuing the people of Burke. How to Train Your Dragon is based off of the book series by Cresta Cow, and I have to make a little bit of an admission here, I didn't see the first film when it was in cinemas, I slept on it, mostly because I was 19 at the time, there was nothing about the advertising that even remotely suggested it was aimed at someone like me, so I only saw it many years later when it was on television and found myself being very pleasantly surprised by it, and how intelligent and witty the script was, and just how much heart there was in the movie, and the unexpected emotional heft that it has in combination with its stunning animation and cinematography. And I definitely went to check out the second movie when it was in cinemas, and I thought that while it wasn't quite up to the same level of the first film, it definitely tried to match it. It was bigger and more ambitious, and a lot of what made the first film work is still present in the sequel, in spite of some weaker elements, most notably an underwhelming villain. And a lot of the success of the How to Train Your Dragon franchise can be placed at the feet of Dean DeBlois, who has written and directed all three entries in this franchise. And I think that fans have very much been looking forward to this third entry, which serves as the climax of the series, but I'd imagine it's very much anticipated within DreamWorks as well, who have had a very tumultuous last decade. You can see that because all the How to Train Your Dragon films have each individually been distributed by a different major studio because DreamWorks has changed hands that many times, including a attempt to be bought out by Hasbro that didn't quite work out, and now they've been bought by Universal, who also owns Illumination, and Illumination's Chris Melodondri has been brought in to work on DreamWorks projects as well. This is the first film that DreamWorks is releasing, distributed by Universal, and in fact, it's their first release in 18 months. And despite the anticipation for this movie, I have to admit that the Hidden World is probably the weakest in the series, and I can say that fairly confidently because I did actually revisit the first two entries for this review. With that being said, a lot of what fans liked about the first two films is still very much in abundance here, especially in the core dynamic between Hiccup and Toothless that is the centre of this trilogy. At their heart, the How to Train Your Dragon films are essentially a variation of the boy and his pet. And you can even see this in the design of Toothless, which is intentionally meant to be an amalgamation of a dog and a cat. In terms of his features, he's got the very feline eyes and just general proportions and shape, but in terms of his behaviours, he acts more like a dog, and you can see this in the very early scene where Hiccup keeps throwing his artificial foot for Toothless to play fetch with, and he's drooling all over it. That's unmistakable, but in general, Toothless is a very winning creation. He's a adorably cute, and it's very hard to resist. And I will give this series a lot of credit. It's a fantastic coming-of-age story, especially when you look over them as a whole. There is a just general sense of progression in terms of the characters and their journeys, even between films, and I think you can definitely see that in the way that their designs also evolve. It's not quite as radical in this third movie as it was between the first and third because there's less time passing in universe and that's reflected in the audience for this movie. A lot of the people going to see this third outing likely saw the first when they were kids and they've grown up alongside it and by this point they're in their late teens or even full grown adults but nevertheless because of that they have a strong emotional connection to the characters and their story and on a storytelling level the How to Train Your 
Dragon series has always done an excellent job of making sure that Hiccup and Toothless's arcs mirror each other over each film. So in the first film, Toothless loses his tail wing at the hands of Hiccup, which is echoed later on when Hiccup loses his foot. In the second movie, Hiccup becomes the chieftain of Burke and Toothless becomes the alpha of the dragons. In the third film, they're essentially learning how to become independent of each other, and it's always been mentioned how they're roughly the same age, so they mirror each other's struggles very deliberately. And so in this film, Hiccup has to decide what kind of leader he's going to be. He's still relatively fresh in his position, and he knows he's going to be a very different kind of ruler to his late father's stoic, but nevertheless, he can't help but compare himself to his legacy, and feeling that he comes up short and doesn't command the same level of respect from his people. And as the film progresses, he realises that he can draw strength from his relationship with his lover Astrid, voiced by America Ferreira, that she is there to impart advice and to back him up when he needs it. It's essentially a romance story at the centre of this film that solidifies what they've established over the course of two previous movies. And Hiccup finds his own inner strength and realises that the fact that he's an unlikely Viking is probably his greatest asset and that his ability to command isn't reliant on having a dragon. And that's mirrored in Toothless's arc, which is a more conventional romance between him and the Light Fury. And what really surprised me about this movie is just how well the sequences between those two work, because they're really very visual in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of dialogue, and yet, the dynamic between the two characters is enough that it carries whole scenes. Some of the best scenes in the movie are to do with the Furies, especially the early meat cute where Toothless is trying to attract her attention, be it a mating dance that looks decidedly clumsy, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of amusing physical comedy there, but also the genuine heart and sincerity that has always been crucial to this series. Some of these sequences between the two Furies are some of the most stunning in the film. The cinematography of the series has always been a high point. Notably, Roger Deakins, the cinematographer, has served as a consultant of all three films. You can definitely see that at points because there are really jaw-dropping moments, and especially in the romantic scenes between the Furies. They carry the film almost by themselves. However, when you look past those central dynamics, that's where problems start to emerge, especially on a storytelling level, because I don't think this is nearly as fleshed out as the first two films, and probably could have benefited from a little bit more time in development. And symptomatically, you can see this in the supporting characters. When Hiccup mentions how Burke is overcrowded, he might as well be talking about the film itself. There is far too many legacy characters they brought back simply because they had major roles in previous movies without giving them anything to do. Almost all the characters from the first two films return in some way. Even Stoic, who was killed off in the second movie, returns for a couple of flashbacks here, but I find myself wondering, would anyone really miss Kit Harrington's Dragon Hunter if they didn't bring him back for a couple of lines of exposition? The fellow Dragon Riders, they really don't get very much do. I like the fact that they evolve the designs even further, so most of them are now attempting to grow beards, like Fish Legs now has a full beard. There's a running joke about how Tough Nut, not voiced by T.J. Miller this time, is using his braided long hair and pretending that that's a beard. That actually got me. But a lot of their humour fell really flat for me, especially because it felt really forced. They're simply there to be comic relief, and they're getting to the point where they're not obnoxiously funny as they started out as. They're just simply obnoxious. But what really surprised me 
is just how little they gave Kate Blanchett. She was a major part of the second movie, playing Hiccup's long-lost mother, and here she really doesn't do very much other than dispense a couple of words of wisdom and dropping out of the movie for long stretches. After the initial setup of the first act where they have to leave Burke, it feels like to me the movie is in something of a holding pattern until the third act rolls around. This is especially true in the middle of the film, where they arrive on a new island and make camp, and there's nothing particularly interesting or distinctive about the island, the location, or what's going on on it for a long time. The characters are just simply waiting around a lot of the time, which really surprised me given the dynamic storytelling that you see in the first two films, and yet I found my attention wavering somewhat. Even more disappointingly, considering that it's much promised all the way through the film, even by its subtitle and especially by the marketing materials that has very much put it front and centre, the hidden world is barely a thing in this movie. We only go inside it in one sequence, which is maybe less than five minutes of actual screen time, which is very disappointing. There's a lot of possibilities here that simply aren't explored. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of this world, considering that it's supposed to play a major part in this story, and yet it feels like an afterthought. And it's also such a shame, because it's where some of the most visually spectacular moments of the film happen, and disappointingly, you've probably seen most of it in the trailers already, which is very strange. I mean, why would you choose a fairly nondescript island instead of the glorious crystalline world of the dragons? Why would you do that? That's such a perplexing storytelling decision to me. And again, the weakest aspect of this movie is its villain. I'm just going to come out and say this. The How to Train Your Dragon sequels have villain problems because they change their minds midway through development or production, and then they have to fill a hole which reflects poorly on the end product. In general, this series has a bit of a tenuous relationship with villain characters to begin with because the whole point of the first movie is that people can change, they can reform, and so that's a bit of an uncomfortable thing to shoehorn a villain into. In the second film, Volker was going to be that film's antagonist. It was going to be a big major twist, and then they decide they weren't going to do that, so they split it into two characters. And you'll notice how Drago in that movie doesn't really appear until the halfway point, at which point there's no real time to establish him properly as any kind of credible threat or to give him any kind of nuance other than just being evil. They attempt some ideas of mirroring Hiccup, like he's a warped version of him, especially the fact that he lost an arm in the same way that Hiccup lost his foot, but it doesn't really go anywhere because he's essentially a character that is very much designed to fill in a void. That's all he is. And the thing is, in this movie, he was meant to come back originally. They were going to close off that arc and develop him even further, but then Steven Spielberg told Du Bois that maybe he shouldn't bring him back because there are far too many characters. There weren't going to be enough time to actually resolve that in a way that would be satisfactory. And maybe Spielberg has a point, but I still think it would have been a better idea to bring that character back than create another villain character. They're both extremely generic characters that have no room for development whatsoever. They are essentially just there to have an antagonist in the movie. And in general, this character doesn't feel like much of a threat. Characters talk about, oh, he's so intelligent, he's so cunning, you'll never be able to see him coming. And it feels like those are informed attributes, because nothing about the way that he acts in this movie really suggests that. When he gets victories in this film, it isn't because of his strategies, it's because things fall into his lap, almost literally in one example. It's because of characters acting idiotically for the sake of the plot. That doesn't show that the character is really a mastermind in the way the film is trying to, and in general, he just feels 
incredibly stock, and they might actually be an even weaker villain than Drago, who at least managed to cause some major damage in his scenes later on in the second film. And it's one of the major problems with this movie. He's supposed to be a character that challenges Hiccup's worldview, that makes him see that maybe some people can't be reformed, and yet there's no time actually devoted to that in the film's arc, disappointingly. It again feels like you had some ideas, but you didn't really execute all of them to their fullest advantage. But for all the issues that I had with this movie, in the grand scheme of things, it probably won't really matter, especially if you're a fan of this series, because by the time the ending flies around, it sticks the landing. It's pretty clear Du Bois knew exactly how he wanted to wrap things up, and the rest of the movie is essentially just to ferry us to that point. And it is exactly what it is. It's a proper conclusion. It's not standing up for future sequels or spin-offs. It's wrapping things up and closing the book. It's a farewell. And it does this in the most beautiful, heartfelt, bittersweet, but also heartbreaking way all at the same time. And if you've had an emotional connection to these characters, it's going to get very emotional. And so I think that that's definitely what audiences are going to carry out of this movie. Not the problems, they're going to carry away the ending because it's a fitting resolution to what I think is a fantastic series of films. I enthusiastically recommend that you watch all three of these movies. Yeah, the third film doesn't quite compare to the first two, but really, that's because they soared to such heights. How to Train Your Dragon The Hidden World is probably the weakest entry in the trilogy, not quite reaching the heady heights of its predecessors. This is largely because the story here feels rather underwritten, uneventful, and even though almost all the characters from the previous two films return, it gives them very little to do other than stand around in the background. Also, just like the previous sequel, F. Murray Abraham's villain is very generic and underwhelming, feeling like more of a nuisance than a menace. Even The Hidden World is only actually visited for a few precious, if gorgeous, minutes, despite the fact that it's so central to the plot is the film's subtitle. However, the core relationship between Hiccup and Toothless is what carries this entry, in addition to the dazzling animation we've come to expect from this series, especially in the wordless romance between the two Furies. Ultimately, though, the film's emotional final moments will satisfy fans of what is overall a very strong trilogy, despite the weaknesses of this outing. If you like this review, then you can soar on over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server, but until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. It's you and me, bud. Always.